All battle stations, Mr. Sue. Battle stations. All hands to battle stations. I remember there was one particular idea that emanated from a story conference where the writer threw several ideas at us and uh, we either had something like that similar to that in work or it wasn't satisfactory. I was there at that meeting and Gene was loath to let this writer go without hiring him. He really liked his work a lot and so Gene pulled out his, his old card and he said why don't we have you do the enemy below and you know anyone in film business knows the enemy below was a motion picture which pitted an american destroyer captain against a german u-boat commander he is there somewhere i feel it the, the writer went home and and wrote this thing and came on back and was came out as a show called balance of terror in which we see for the first time creatures that look like Spock. They're noble, even as our folks are noble. And it made a deep impression, I think, on a lot of people. People are more similar than they are dissimilar. Uh, and when I say people, I should say life forms. It was a show of immense strength of will and character and philosophy, and uh, I was quite pleased with it. What purpose will it serve to die? We are creatures of duty, Captain. I have lived my life by it. Just one more duty to perform. Romulans got to be because Paul Schneider's son was crazy for the Roman Empire at that point in his life. And he said, can we change those <laughs> to Romulans? And I say, sure, what the hell? Gee, I said, I don't care. So these people became Romulans, and the battles went on and everything else, but why they were Romulans, which stuck, he did it as a, a, a thing for his boy, which I think is nice. Now. Harlan's piece, the city, had a quality of fun in it. Spock's ears, for example, with the hat. Uh, that was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And that was written. That was that didn't just happen. <laughs> that little idiot sat down at his typewriter and he did it, and that's what he did. Uh, and that's what was good about that piece. In City on the Edge of Forever, Harlan brought to it a literary quality mm -hmm. to the characters that hadn't been there. They were. It could have been a short story. It really could have. And that was one of the magical things about that. No chill. Now, I can remember when, when John was first starting out to write in television, uh, he got a Bible on a show, and the, uh, the, the lead character would never do this. The lead character would always do that, and I don't. I don't remember anything from J.R. that was in that direction. Of uh, Kirk would never. Kirk would do anything as long as it was entertaining and worked and uh, exciting. In a critical orbit, there's no time for surprise. Unless you people on the bridge start taking showers with your clothes on, my engines can pull us out of anything. We'll be warping out of orbit within a half second of getting your command. George Clayton Johnson, when he got hold of the concept of Star Trek, he sat down with his mind and came back with the absolute conviction, no way around it, that there were two men who should be friends, who should be buddies, absolutely close as they could be. Joined at the hip, kind Joined of Joined at the hip. One was Scotty and the other was Kirk. They each owned a piece of that ship, and Scotty absolutely agreed with him. And then the script got over to me and to GR, and it couldn't possibly go that way because the unity had to be on the bridge. McCoy came in, and he just, when he had the first couple of lines where he got teed off at Spock, the way he bit those lines off, there was no way anybody would ever change that. Well, besides, Dick Kelly was such a charming performer. Yeah. You're not going to admit that for the first time in your life, 
you committed a purely human, emotional act? No, sir. <laughs> Mr. Spock, you're a stubborn man. Yes, sir. <laughs> we had the breaks. First, everybody who was involved with Star Trek on the writer's side uh, shared respect one for one another. Now, I'm not sure what Gene did. I mean, I can't talk for, I can't speak for him. But I can speak for the Teddy Sturgeons and the Harlan Ellisons and the George Clayton Johnsons and, and the whole lot of guys that were there. They all respected each other. They knew each other's work inside and out. What did it do to us? We've regressed in time, 71 hours. It is now three days ago, Captain. We have three days to live over again. It's no wonder that an Asimov or uh, any of the other, in quotes, great science fiction writers loved Star Trek. Of course they did. This was a shock. These writers were working. They were, they were showing the world what science fiction really could be. What it was was Star Trek. And Star Trek was science fiction for the world. Everybody. You say science fiction, they say Star Trek. Fascinating. Ray Bradbury uh, <laughs> came in uh, of an afternoon, and Ray Bradbury is one of the most gracious writers in the town. I don't think anybody ever hears him uh, uh, snipe at another writer. He always says please and thank you when he is at a social function. He is uh, a delightful person and he he looked at all of the art objects that had to do with the sets and the costumes. He talked very graciously to everybody, including the secretaries. He was ushered around the offices and around the sets and shook hands and complimented everyone. And then he went home. And that was it. He obviously had no intention of getting involved with the science. For the a, ser a series, <laughs> yeah. a television series. But it, was it, was, it. it was really beneath him. But it was, it was, such, it was one of the most amiable rejections anybody could ever have had. <laughs>